boy grabbed the log chain and then he grabbed his gun. He had to fight that fight over that dimity down. I do too. We had three tables yesterday. So does he. <laughs> How many people here do zines or have ever done a project or planning on doing a project that they wanted to get some sort of distribution? Awesome. And how many people here do a distro or have done a distro or want to do it some sort of distro? Wow, all right. Awesome. Um, I just became interested in zines when I was in high school, which was some time ago, but decided to actually just just sort of reading zines, and, uh, and then I decided I would, I would do a zine. In 1993, I put out the first issue of Spectacle, and, you know, it was... It was definitely a first time, first uh, effort, and was declined by every single distributor I sent copies to. And then I, you know, kind of got some suggestions from a few of the uh, distributors that cared enough to write a, a note, or, or you know, were of a size they could write a note, and sort of made some changes. And uh, with number two, I got picked up, I guess, by a couple of the smaller distros. Uh, Blacklist Mail Order, which was one of the mainstays for a long time, and went out of business several years ago. But um, I guess kind of what I wanted to talk to you here was experiences that I've had dealing with other distros, experiences with getting things I've done published, or not published, but distributed, and also talk about our experiences with Tree of Knowledge and building a dis distro ourselves or a mail order ourselves and I kind of want to talk about the difference between a mail order and a distributor. So distribution is more in the business of getting zines or books or records or whatever to stores and to other tabling projects or smaller mail orders, etc. For example, uh, AK Press, while they do a lot of individual mail order business, they also distribute large quantities or even single copies to stores, to um, you know, whatever. Jen got stuff from them to table here and could do it where she would keep some of the money. Like, not only does she get a discount on the stuff she gets, they get an even bigger discount when they get it from the publishers. So, kind of just the mechanics of that, the, the math involved would be distributors get things at more than wholesale rate. You get a really good discount on it if you're a distributor. And then, but in return, you sell it for up to 40% off to other stores. So you're actually only going to make 10 to 15% of the cover price of an item that you sell. So I found out really fast that I had this plan to start a distribution or a mail order to make money to publish things. And that's got to be the worst possible way to ever make a penny is to start a distribution because you're only going to realize 10 to 15 percent um, profit. <coughs> anyway, I kind of just was going to talk about what we look for in zines when we get them. So, uh, and how, okay, going about getting your zine or your project distributed. We are working on a new list of small distributors and what they care. And it's not ready yet. We've got some information from Jen and some other people. It's being compiled now. And I have a list here that we could pass it around, I guess. We'll put it on the table. And anybody who wants to can sign up to get an information packet. I'll mail these out free of charge to anybody that wants them. It'll have a list of all the We'll have a list of all the distros we know about, a list of the distros, and distro here, I mean mail order mainly, um, and distros that we go through for projects we publish, people that we really think are reliable. Unfortunately, I can count them on one hand, but, you know, 
there's a lot of people we haven't dealt with, so I'm not saying there's only five good ones. Don't even try anyone else. I just think that there's there's about five or so that are really reliable. I guess I can name those. That'd be Left Bank Distribution out of Seattle. They distribute to stores as well as uh, as individual mail order. There's uh, Primordial Soup Kitchen from Claremont, California. Um, um, newer distro from where's Words as Weapons? Michigan. Ann Arbor, Michigan. Which one? Words as Weapons. Okay. Um, also, a stick figure mail order from Atlanta, Georgia. And Gavin Frederick does records and zines and books, and it's quite an operation. It's a lot of just non. I don't know. It's not. It's not that it's not a huge thing like Barry or some of the larger dark distros or like Fine Print used to be, but it's it's growing really big. It's one of the larger small distros. Um, after you obtain a list or whatever of, of what you want to of who to send them to, or you can send a sample copy. One of the problems we get sometimes people send us a box of thirty zines. The first time we've ever seen it. On the off chance it's something that's really great and we we would be fine with carrying, that's fine. But ninety-eight times out of a hundred, it's something we wouldn't want to carry. And now we have and sometimes they send an invoice. You know, send us fifty bucks or whatever when you, you know, when you receive this. And that actually happens more often than you would think. And that's the first big no no. I mean, send a sample copy and you'll be considered should be gotten back to in a reasonable amount of time. We work on a reasonable amount of time. <laughs> Mary and I basically do all the work. We have another volunteer who helps us can read things for consideration, but it takes it takes a long time to read a bunch of scenes. You know, we might get 15 or 20 a week, sometimes more. It's like, you know, we, we don't want to just glance at them. A lot of them are like, you know, political theory and stuff like that. They're pretty like, Hardcore, like takes a big chunk of time to go. Another thing you should consider is not every distro wants to carry just anything. Like we sort of focus on somewhat political stuff that's somewhat political in nature. That's what we as individuals are interested in. Uh, we also carry a lot of comics. We I mean, we're not limited to that, but that's what we're really interested in. And just on a pra just on a practical level, we can't carry everything. No one can carry everything. And uh, so there is some sort of considerations as far as that goes. There are also several other things we look for. I mean, and, and, and anyone who wants to send a project out to be distributed should ask themselves a few questions. Would you buy this if you didn't know who you were? Is it relevant outside of you and your you know, six friends of yours that have some in joke? Like, yeah, we get stuff sometimes. It's like I have no idea what this is about. Like I don't know. They're, they're just start reading. It's talking about these people on a first name basis. You don't know who they are. It's not interesting to me. I don't understand why. Just anyone would want to read it. I mean, sometimes we carry some personal zines. I'm not saying that's not relevant. Just is it really something that people would have an interest outside of who you know? If if not. Don't send it to be distributed internationally. <coughs> no one's going to pick it up. Um, there's certain factors just with with the basic look of a publication. I, this is a touchy. We've we've been criticized by a lot of people for declining publications based on their overall appearance. If something's not readable, no one's going to pick it up. We've had that. We learned that the hard way. When I first started, I took all kinds of things, basically anything that was sent in, and or things I would. I used to read reviews in the larger publications, and anything that got a good review, I would. Think, oh, this must be great. Order ten copies. Learned real fast that reviewers need to be a little more uh, honest with <laughs> the reviews they give. Um, again, it's practical concerns, especially if you're buying up front. If a distributor buys something up front. They can't just take anything that uh, comes through. There's there's considerations as far as what is realistically going to move. It's an investment. That's that makes sense. Um, is 
things like margins and the layout and stuff, like we'll get things that the content is really not bad, but you can only read half of the paragraph because it's like right here and then the last of the <laughs> sentence is just like non existent. Yeah. And it's something, you know, just like if you do a zine and you're laying it out, like layout's really important. Like make it clean and readable. And if you reprint things, like copy quality is really important. Like people will reprint flyers and stuff like that, but it's been like shrunken down and copied like 80 times and it's just like black, like mush, you know. And, like, <laughs> you know read anything about it. Yeah, definitely. Uh, last consideration. There's a book. If, if you're publishing a zine and, and you, you know you're, you don't have much experience, there's a book called Make a Zine by uh, Bill Brent. Bill Brent. Yeah. Thanks. I I blanked out. Uh, we carry it. You can get it a lot of places. Uh, I've actually seen it in a lot of stores even. I've seen it in libraries. I saw it with Tulsa Public Library. Fantastic. Yeah. Tulsa Public Library has a copy. It's a builder. But it, it, it's a great resource. You know, it, it just it's got everything you need to know. It talks about layout, it talks about text editing, it just, you know, it's just it's great. You know, I wish we could send a copy to everyone who uh, sent a zine in to us that declined for whatever reason. It would just really cut down on the on the mediocrity. Um, talk about yeah, just well, another consideration is to have the price worked out. Um, ideally, the zine will have a cover price on the cover, and a distributor will sell it for that cover price, or a, a you know mail order tabling project, whatever, sell it for that cover price, and under that. They will send 60% of the profit to the, uh, or 60% of the sale goes to the publisher, the editor, or whatever, and 40% goes to the <coughs> store that sold it, or the mail order that sold it, which is what I just already talked about, I guess. Um, you don't forget to figure in the postage on a cover price, make the cover price. I learned that the hard way, lost a whole lot of money uh, on a back issue of it. Figure it out. Um, does anybody else want to share anything about trying to get their zine distributed? Ask any questions about how you do it? Uh, that was, sometimes, like, maybe, it, maybe it's just like in like the zine community in general, there's a lot of weird stuff. Like, if you, if you have one cover price, so you try to stick to that cover price normally. Because the thing is, like, when you print stuff and it's like, there's a really weird stigma attached to, like, charging any more than you yeah. pay to print it. Right. Like if I charge 50 cents for a zine that costs 35 cents to print, and people like look at it and they're like, well, I've made a zine before and it costs less than that. I don't know. But I guess that's just, that's a whole, I mean, I know it's a whole different thing, but when you yeah. make cover prices or if you ask for stamps for your zine, like even, if you, even if you're just distributing your own zine, that's something you can do. And people said stamps like that rocks, that rocks so much. You can, like, Oh, yeah. to get out, yeah. but. Well, I mean, yesterday, I don't know if, if everyone was there when we were on the panel, like, we're talking about just labor. Like, like you, I mean, everybody what makes about so it? much, like, so, like, dollars, 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 so much more than, it's much less than, like, even minimum wage people. Right. If you exactly. charge, like, minimum exactly. wage for how much you make, you all the labor people oh, your zines, be like, yeah, this zine costs $500. <laughs> yeah, oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I don't know, I mean, I think. A good zine is, is worth, you know, a couple of dollars. Yeah. I mean, size is a factor, of course. Yeah. The factor you have to put in copying, though, is the fact that different copy places have different places. Different I, mean, I mean, I used to do Kinko's for a while, and then I found a place that was, like, half the price, and yeah. if I let them do it, and they don't ask any questions, so I kind of, like, kind of gravitated to there, cut the cost down, but I kind of earned it back up when I started putting more pages in, so. Yeah. You also have to, I think, when you put a price in, I mean, stamps is a great thing, and I try to encourage people to do that too, because it'd be, it's always nice to get those. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, stamps but, is like, it's as good, as good as money for us, you know. We do so much mailing. No kidding, yeah. I think when you people, get $5 in stamps, that's $5. I think when people have to realize on the cover prices, you know, is that they're also sometimes planning for the future. You know, it may not necessarily cost that much to print it out, but if you're going to get larger, you got to kind of think of that goal in mind. Or just put out another issue ever. You yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, um, that's a good point. No. I was just going to say, just for people who do fanzines and send them out, especially like because it's such a 
like it's your product. It's kind of like you. And just, I mean, if you get rejected from a distributor, it's just important not to like completely write them off because doing a good zine is something that takes so much practice. Like nobody really puts out a, a bang up first issue. Very few first issues are, are even readable, <laughs> you know? And don't take it really personally. Don't write off a distributor if they reject you the first time around. Like even though that's your, up, oftentimes your first instinct is to like, well, mm -hmm. I mean, it takes a lot of practice. Don't get discouraged about it. A lot of people give us crap too that we won't carry it. And a lot of times it's like people send the scenes that are good, but they're, the material is something we already have. You know, like we have scenes that cover the same topics, and so we turn it down because, like Theo said, we can't carry everything. And a lot of the times it's even a matter of like the scenes are kind of mediocre. There's like half of it's really good, and then half of it they just threw it in to fill up the pages and they put it out. I guess it's another thing about like, if you do a zine, like do it for quality. Like don't make like if you set a deadline, that's great to get it done. But don't just put shit in there to you know <laughs> like yeah. you know like take an extra month to make it really worthwhile. Do you know just like offhand uh, which distros carry a lot of comics? Yeah, um, that's. Since that's not what I've ever produced, I don't really know a lot about it. We carry, we're really widening our comic selection right now. And I don't know, I think we carry a pretty, oh, we're just in the process of kind of expanding it. But uh, Have you ever uh, seen the Small Fresh Creators Explosion? Yeah. It's a zine, and it mainly deals with underground comics. It's really awesome. And uh, you should try to check that out because they review a lot of things, and that's. We've gotten, we got a good review for Playground on the side there. We've had What's it called again? Small Press Creative Explosion. Small Press. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I don't Primordial know. Soup Kitchen, I think. Yeah, Primordial Soup Kitchen, which is one of the ones that uh, I deal with that I was going to recommend. Uh, if you sign up here, we'll send a list and try to, you know, I don't know if we should pass this around or, I mean, not like some people don't have something to write on, but. Um, Go ahead and pass it around and then we can put it back up here at the end. But, and uh, you can check on there, one or both. There's two columns. One is, we're going to put together an information packet also on how to start your own mail order. And, and kind of keep up with it, how to keep records. Just some kind of basic tips that we learned the hard way that might help Let's somebody else. Them. You want to hear them? Yeah. Well, how about, okay. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other questions as far as how to go about getting your zine distributed? I don't really too hard. You may ask questions, they're welcome to write what or ask. For what about some of the specifics like before when you're talking about like having the title at the top and Yeah, color. yeah, there's lots of yeah. uh, lots of really good I have a few more notes here. Um in the difference to just in addition to the kind of layout and, and concerns, just like Jen I guess talked about having the title across the top so they would be visible on a magazine rack. Since we are basically, we just are a mail order, so we don't really deal with, we don't have displays except for tabling. It's also good for tabling because we have limited table space. It's really great to stack things on the table like this. If you have your title across the top of the zine, someone who's tabling can easily maximize their table space by overlaying co single copies and uh, still be able to read your title. Um, you have the cover price. Have a cover price. Have a cover price. Yeah, price on the cover is a very good idea. Also, um, like Jen talked about, putting on colored paper or having a two-color cover. You really are, it's a competition when it's sitting there. Like if you look at a table full of zines and there's 100 zines on it, I mean, it is sort of a competition for, so for, for eye, you know, just catching your eye. So there's lots of tricks as far as like <coughs> making something that, that leaps out from the, from the pack or whatever. Uh, just like to, to do that. Um, you know, like we talk about just is it readable? One of the, the major downfalls of a lot of zines that, that I read are just things, it looks like they haven't even been proofread at all. And I don't know, I mean, I guess there's somewhat, there's some sort of strange attitude that, well, it's not really, it's not punk or whatever to, to make it look too polished or, or whatever to have it sound overly academic. But I mean, basic spelling and grammar, I mean, it really is, it speaks well to, to, you know, put a little time into editing. Kind of. Goes around and stuff like that, though, where it's like, 
people totally discuss that. People are like completely dyslexic and like they, yeah. they cannot write. But it's like, because I have friends that like they do stuff and like it's great. And I'm like, I'm so glad you did this. This yeah. is so awesome. But then I'm like, you wish you could edit it for them. Yeah. yeah. It's, and it's, like, it's, that. it's really, really important to be able to do that. But it's also really important, like, when just when you're looking at dead scenes in general, like, if you're not, like, trying like, for discos, like, I understand, like, that's definitely something that gets looked at. Like, just people in general, when you read scenes, like, you shouldn't totally discount some, what somebody has to say just because, like, they're not. Sure. That's so. Right. That. That's, yeah. like, that's important, but you should also just be willing to look past that, too, sometimes. In some situations, like, if it, that is definitely a deciding factor, like, for me. If I look at scenes, I'm just reading it, I can't decide if I like it that much or not. Like, if it's, if I have to go in and be like, okay, I think they meant this, probably. I probably just put this word in here by accident. Right. It's okay. No, that's true. I mean, that brings up a lot of other crazy issues, issues as well. Like, you know, Jen and I had a, Jen and I had a long conversation just about class issues. Yeah, and totally. And stuff, and yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of, a lot of other concerns, but I'm just saying, like, if you're trying to get something distributed, if, if you're trying to get the big, highest quality, yeah. get an editor, if that's what you, I mean, yeah, like get, some, well, get one of your friends to look at it. Get an editor, it. yeah, just ask a friend, that's what you're that's I, mean, I, I just back it by myself, you know, I just, you know, bug it, just to work. You know, make sure it's all real words. Yeah, and then, you know, my, my grammar's not that hot, and uh, my spelling's, you know, atrocious, so it helps. Yeah, totally. Um, the type of font is important. Um, Handwriting, especially scenes that have handwritten type, like that's great if you do it, but it has to be legible. Like it has to be big enough to be, like comma bus is amazing. You know, like you couldn't tell that it's handwriting, but not saying that it has to look like comma bus, but just. Uh, last year at, at the bums, uh, last year I was tabling and some someone was looking at a comic bus, and I was joking around with them and I just said, yeah, that's. Uh, I said that's the. Uh, or they said, is this a computer font or is this a. A, uh, a handwriting, and I said, "Oh no, it's it's a computer font." I mean, I said, you know, you can get it now. Aaron Comic Bus made a deal with uh, Microsoft. And, you know, <laughs> put it and, you know, like everyone was like, "Really, really?" Like all these people, like, yeah. And even somebody that was with me was like, "Yeah, really? That's wild." And I was like, no, "I'm just kidding." Yeah. <laughs> he uses, uh, graph paper. Yeah, he does he use graph uh, paper underneath it. Blue line, line graph, graph paper, paper rocks. or even just lined paper, you know, to keep it so it's not right. Blue line paper won't, uh, when you print it, offset print it, it won't uh, pick up the blue lines, so it just, just looks like a white sheet. That's how he does it. Do you have info on that small press thing you guys are talking sure, about? Sure, yeah, I do. I'm not, I bet I have an address somewhere I can dig up over there. Great. The Small Publishers Co-op is where a lot of zines are starting to go to do their printing. And it's really fantastic because it's like a, a business that's sort of set up kind of along a somewhat alternative economic idea. It's member owned. Everybody who publishes there is a member. You pay twenty dollars and you become a member. And I think it's a one time deal. You don't have to renew it every year. It um, we publish our catalogs there. And what they do is they lump they have two print deadlines per month and they lump everybody's stuff together. And they do it on a web offset press, which is the huge press with the rolls of paper. And because they lump them all together, they end up getting just the economics of scale of it. They're doing such a gigantic print run that they get crazy discount and then they cut it all up and divide them up and everyone's just done separately and it ends up being like half the cost of anywhere else and it's it's like it, it's all zines and comics basically okay. Okay. what's the like, minimum print run the minimum print run is 500 copies i believe i think you can do 500 but i'm not it, even but it is it, maybe it's a it thousand gets cheaper the more you do the more you do the cheaper it is we did 5,000 catalogs and um 16 pages. Anybody doesn't have one, is welcome to get one. I mean, not just to just to check out the printing, of course. <laughs> but it's, uh, I mean, it's it really it's, it's high quality. It's it's better than a lot of the newsprint I've seen. And uh, the 16 page book that we did, 5,000, and it was $600 delivered to our door, which is a good price. I mean, I don't know what that is per, per one, but uh, but it's not. Another it's not thing bad. they do is they have a uh, a catalog that they mail out to everyone that prints form, and I just have a mailing list too. And um, if you get your a zine or a catalog published there, they put it in the catalog. So <coughs> it's free advertising. And it, it's not just newsprint. It used to be, but now they also do white bond paper. And uh, the new Fuck Tooth, number 23, is was done there, and it, it's incredibly good quality. Was the cover done there? Yeah, they did the cover on just a sheet-fed offset press. 
which is like your standard offset printing press. And that, that cost them a bit extra, but uh, <coughs> not a big deal. Can they can even do like two color printing? Yeah, they can do uh, spot color and, uh, and uh, every time I get a mailing from them, they have some great, great new capability. They have a new binding machine or, I mean, it, it, and you can even go down there and get a discount off your press run by helping them put it together. Like they'll, they'll teach you how to do it. It's in Sarasota, Florida. It's called the Small Publishers Co-op. And if you sign up on that list, I'll mail you information about that as well. Uh, Robert and Tyler. Um, that's what I was going to ask. Was uh, they they save a lot of their money, don't they, by doing stapling, trimming, yeah, they do that collating, right. all that. And another thing I was going to just point out. It's so like I mean, get us if you do a zine, staple it. Like I don't know if you guys mentioned this, but rubber bands, rubber bands, no no, yeah. all that, or yeah. sell it. Or sell it. Yeah, something, so, please. Yeah. We have an industrial stapler that we got for free. Yeah. It's a saddle stitch binder. And it's old as dirt, but it, I mean, in fact, we had to, when we ran out of staples, we had to special order them, and they, they didn't even know. And it, this thing's like, it's really old. It's all mechanical. It's a, it's a big machine. You can just stomp on it. Well, you staples. Can get like, like a saddle stitch stapler with the adjustable arm, like they have at Kinko's, yeah, and it'll staple bucks. up to 20 pages, which is an 80 page zine. Which is pretty thick. Yeah. And you know, actually, it'll stable more than 20 pages. Oh, really? It says 20 is the limit, but I, I mean, I figured, you know, give it a yeah. It's the long adjustable up. arm. Yeah. And long reach one. Yeah. They'll do more than 20. It's it's got the adjustable arm, so it staples at, at the right the right place every time. Yeah. And it's, it's a good investment. I've yeah. got all. You've got like 20, 25 dollars. Yeah. But you're gonna buy dollars. Um. But yeah. So that you know. No, I don't need that. But yeah. So what, we staple some that aren't staple, but it's. Like rubber bands kind of work for about two months and then they rot and they fall off. And like we have a zine library in Little Rock and that's a big problem is that a lot of them are done with rubber bands and like they're falling apart. And I'm sure that's something you've come across too. Kind of so staple them. Yeah, they deteriorate and we lose pages and it's a good idea. Um, yeah, Tyler. Um, a lot of times if you guys look around town and just look into phone books and stuff like that, you can find resources. Like there's small mom and pop print shops and there's smaller places around town that you can get stuff done for pretty cheap, like one two color printing. A lot of times it's an offset or it's like Sir Speedy's or something like that. Um, there's a guy in town that runs a letter press shop called Hammer Press. He did the Sparrow's Fall cover once and he, he's done stuff for uh, the Resound zine that Recycled Sounds puts out. It has sort of a retro sort of feel. He's a really cool guy and I'm sure, you know, if you talk to him, probably pretty inexpensive, but there are resources locally that, you know, that if you do a little homework and make some phone calls and stuff, and comparing prices is really important, you know, in that area too, like, you know, this guy here said he went to Kinko's, but, you know, then he found some place that was half the price, so it's important to shop around and, you know, collect prices and do some homework on that kind of stuff. I think that's important too, we kind of talked a little bit about it earlier, a lot of people copy their zines at Kinko's, and a lot of people can do it for free through various scams and stuff. And one thing we were talking about is, uh, you know, the independent press relies a lot on that, a lot on, like, scamming copies, Kinko's and other places. And, you know, it's a question of, like, is the independent press really supporting itself? You know, is it really independent? If they independent? can't, you know, pay for the printing and operate, that you know, has to rely on, like, stealing, is it, you know, it's not independent. I mean, we're, to we're totally vultures. Yeah. Like, and, and, and I mean, and like, we use it too, but, yeah. you know, it's just... It's always nice to support people that yeah. you want to support when you can. Yeah. And if you can go to a local business, you, you can feel like, I can, I can go to my covers credit somewhere. That would be so neat to go do that and yeah. get cool covers and support somebody. And there's even yeah. coffee shops. If you don't want to do an offset printing, you can go to some place that's independently owned that's not at Kinko's. Unless you have some sort of hookup or some sort of connection or deal or whatever. If you're printing more than 500 copies of anything, even if it's a single page, it's cheaper to go offset. You can find a place where it's cheaper to go offset. The quality is also higher, um, almost always. And I mean, at, that's like the thing is after setup costs, like my parents own a print shop, so like setup cost, I've talked to them, it's, it's all setup costs. And like, because I mean, after that, the stock is so cheap that it's so much more economical if you're, if you're, not, if you're kind of wavering between doing 500 and 1,000. If you think you could get rid of somewhere between there, it would almost be better to go with a thousand because it would be so much cheaper after your setup costs. Does anybody know what offset printing is versus Xerox? Okay, sorry. <laughs> Should have said. Um, uh, 
A Xerox machine works by taking that powder, which is the toner, which is plastic, and basically using some heat transferring it onto the uh, page and the image. And it has to set it up every time you, if you, you know, when the when the light runs across that screen of the copier, that's the setup. It's taking a completely new. Every time it makes a copy, it takes a new image, puts it on the roller again, does it all again. With offset printing, they use the liquid ink, and uh, offset. There's a plate with the image on it, and the ink is on the plate, and the rollers roll over. Offsets the image from the plate onto the paper with wet ink, and it dries when it comes out. I would imagine so. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. But it, 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 um, there's only one setup cost. You make the plate, you put it in, and it's really fast. Like, I went, I went and watched a print spectacle before when it was being printed offset, and uh, they turned it on, and they put the plate in there, and they turned it on, and the sheets were just going. And it just shot the whole, like, you know, there's like, you know, like 2,000 in, like, really fast. And, you know, as long as there's enough ink in there, it'll never get gray in one spot, and, you know, it just, if you're doing a large print run, it's faster and cheaper. But well, then when you do the offset, do you send them like stuff that's like double sided already, or you just depending on the place? Sometimes you have to get the, the film made somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Where we went, they did it from start to finish. We just took camera ready <coughs> work. They put it under a piece of glass, and shot it with a camera, made the made the plates there, and did it. So just talk to the local printer. All right. Um, I guess we'll talk. Uh, we only have about 15 minutes left, so we'll just talk about. Uh, sort of how to start a dis distribution and, and sort of some of the things that we've learned <coughs> with uh, what not to do. I guess you like that about the early years. We started, or when I started, uh, back when I was coming up, <laughs> in the early days, so really we, um, it was just me then, and I started out buying everything up front. Tree of Knowledge works on consignment now, which means, well, the way we do it is, like say Scott, Scott published a book, we, uh, we sell Scott's book. What we do is, we just tell Scott, you know, send us 30 copies of your book. And Scott sends us 30 copies of his book and an invoice. Invoice is important. If you do anything on consignment, send them an invoice, keep a copy yourself. And uh, on that invoice, it tells us how much each one is, how much money we owe him with shipping, whatever. We sell the books. What we do is we pay quarterly. We pay at the end of March, we pay at the end of June, the end of September, and the end of December, four times a year. And when those times turn around, we take inventory of everything we have. And whatever we have, we compare that with our invoices that we got whenever people sent us stuff. We subtract how many they sent versus how many we have. That's how many we consider we sold. And we pay each editor, each publisher, every three months for what's what we've sold of their stuff. It's in the checks. And that's sort of the basic way that consignment works. They trust us to do that. We built a relationship with everybody. We started four times a year. And when those times turn around, we take inventory of everything we have. And whatever we have, we compare that with our invoices that we got whenever people sent us stuff. We subtract how many they sent versus how many we have. That's how many we consider we sold. And we pay each editor, each publisher, every three months for what's, what we've sold of their stuff in the checks. And that's sort of the basic way that consignment works. And they trust us to do that. We built a relationship with everybody. We started out, I bought everything up front. I sent, I would write a letter, find out how much everything was. When I first started, I would send Jen Angel $10 for 10 copies of fuck to, or whatever the wholesale rate was. Paid everything up front. And after a while, people we established a trust. And any small distro that starts up, it's going to have to start out probably buying things up front. And now, because I worked with all these people and they consider us to be reliable, you know, we have this for consignment relationship. A lot of people get screwed on consignment. I've gotten screwed. I've lost hundreds of dollars on consignment, if not maybe thousands. And how to scam trust funds? <laughs> how to scam a lot of money? <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you talk to Scott after the workshop? <laughs> just get the just get AT&T to pay for pay for your zines. You don't have to worry about money anymore. Did you hand up? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so yeah, back then that's how we did it, and uh, it just kind of grew slowly. I Xeroxed uh, little catalogs, I remember it was one page, folded in half, I had about 15 zines. I just sold stuff locally first, and then I went after that. Um, can you talk about your time commitments and like your kind of weekly? Oh or yeah, monthly yeah. Back then it was it was nothing, you know. At the beginning, I didn't take any uh, any real time. I just took the time to write 15 little short letters. And then you can write one form letter, you know, Xerox it, send it off to the editors with a couple dollars in there, whatever you need. They send you stuff. Pretty low cost commitment, pretty low time commitment. But then as it started growing, the cost and the time just got bigger and bigger. Yeah, it used to be in an apartment you lived in, and he had the distro there. It, was, it started as two milk crates, yeah. and um, in, in the corner of my bedroom. And then yeah, this apartment is really like one room with the bathroom, and then like a really skinny kind of nook. And it just like when I first met Theo when he was living there, like you could see it kind of the distro started to eat with all of his space, and so it was like tree of knowledge in Theo's bed. Like, it was totally. <laughs> I had all my stuff in the closet, and it was all mixed together with all this the distro stuff. It was a real pain in the ass. And eventually, I got pushed out of my apartment, and I went and lived somewhere else. And we kept running that apartment as the office, and we had that as office space for about what, a year and a half. And then we recently we were losing money. Uh, we weren't doing enough business to sustain that space really, and. Decided Mary volunteered to put it in her house, in the spare room. We pay a percentage of her rent for the house, you know, based on, well, it's not really based on square feet, but you know, it's sort of a rough thing about we paid rent for this room and stuff. But now she's moved, so I'm not sure what's going to happen next. Yeah. Right. So and, you, uh, do you deal with things every day now? Or <coughs> yeah, I've taken over weekend? most of the mail order and like the orders and uh, keeping up with the day-to-day -day stuff, like checking the email and keeping in touch with editors, um, a lot of that. Theo still does some of that. But, uh, what it is, the way we split it up, I, uh, I'm i graduating right now from college and have a lot of time commitment. I also have some research that I'm doing. And I have a job that requires a lot of money. It requires me to be out of town for days on end. <coughs> and, uh, it, I'm limited as far as I can't do the, the 16, 18 hour days anymore and stuff. And Mary's taken over most of the distro. What, like I said, when I started Tree of Knowledge, my, I envisioned it being a publishing operation. I want to publish things. To date, we've, in three years, published one, well, aside from Spectacle, one project. We published a comic called The Playground Messiah that a friend of ours did. And um, it's just, only reason we have it is because there's never enough time to get out from under the day-to-day -day business of running that, the distro to do any publishing stuff. It's always a stack of orders, always catalog requests, need to reprint stuff, got to get new stuff, got to pay editors, got to deal with bills, and all this crap. So it, yeah, it's a huge time commitment at like the level it is now. This time last year, I didn't kind of help it deal a little bit, like not a lot, but helping out, like just collating teams and stuff like that. And he asked for us to be a bigger part of it, and I said yes, and we talked about making it a collective, like letting more people to come in, because it was really, it wasn't enough to be one person's full-time job. And so it requires, like, people donating the time, and it's, right now it's really not enough for both of us to donate the available time we have. Like, I think neither of us really have a lot of free time, and we've tried, bringing in other people to help out with, even if it's just reading zines, or <coughs> driving me to UPS, or um, helping us when we get catalogs and stuff like that. Um, we've had some people come and go. Originally, it was going to be me, Theo, and this guy named Sean <laughs> that turned out to be a complete flake and just took off. Yeah, we had a real, the collective thing, basically, we say it's collectively run because it's collective between Mary and I. We basically share the, all the decision making and stuff. Um, so do you guys distribute just to the elevator and give to stores? Um, we give stuff to stores. Uh, usually they pay up front. Or well, 
They pay by invoice. Yeah. That's how we do with stores because in other distros, the first time anybody buys stuff from us for a store in which they receive a discount, we require them to pay up front. After that, any additional order, we'll send an invoice and they'll have 30 days to pay us. And after that, well, we've never really like gone after anybody, but, but you know, <laughs> we have a paper called the shit list. The shit list. We'll talk shit broken about broken you. Broken lines. No, we'll. Broken I mean, if necessary, you know, I mean, I don't know. In the underground, you don't want to fuck up your credibility. Because people remember. There's people that, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't want to fuck people over. People will definitely spread the word. And, and to some degree, we rely on that to, to uh, keep us from getting screwed. But it's not really worth it. We've gotten screwed plenty of times. And it just sucks because, I mean, Tree of Knowledge and, and a lot of these other projects are projects that are really doing things for a good reason and are not out to make money. They're not the man or whatever. Even anytime you steal from them or fuck them over, you're just fucking over yourself. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, you asked about time commitment and just from living with Theo, he, oh, he didn't mention everything that he does, so I just wanted to say that um, another thing that takes a lot of time, and I don't even think he realizes how much time it takes, is um, writing reviews of all the things that you carry. I mean, that's really important for people to know what what it is so they know if they want to buy it or not, and to do a really good job, and that takes a long time, and it takes longer than you probably would think. And uh, there's something else. Oh, something you said in the other one is that um, when people write you a letter, he said, you know, you should respond. And a lot of people send Theo letters, I mean, or and not just the <coughs> and uh, and I think that if they didn't respond to those letters, they would lose they would lose a lot of the reputation that they have, and a lot of people associate Mary and Theo and the people who help there with Tree of Knowledge, and so it's really a personal thing. And writing letters back is a really important thing, and that takes a lot of time too. So those are just things to think about if you're you know trying to schedule your time just. So yeah, things that yeah, fall through the cracks, they don't seem like official things, but they're really important. So there's somebody in this room sitting here laughing because I have her in the back from last year. <laughs> yeah, I, it, you know, stuff does pile up. I got have a box with probably uh, a couple hundred pieces of mail at any given time. And it's like, when you do it, I got to be a, a bench. Don't do it. You, know, you write the letters in November and mail them all in April. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, she's not exaggerating. No, I'm not. Yeah. I just did that. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> Scott? Um, I, I, I just have to say about Theo is that um, in terms of distribution, like I, I've been dealing, how long have I been dealing with him? Like, for like five years or something. He's the most reliable person out of out of anybody I've dealt with, like in terms of like press, really. And, and like I just had to I had to say that. So like really, if you ever wind up dealing with Theo, you're like, or, or Mary, too, I mean, like, since you're part of the collective, you know, uh, they're they're just absolutely great. They pay on time, and like even if they're a little bit off, it's, they just make sure to get paid. You know, the, to, to get everything paid up. Usually get it within the month after payment is due. A lot of them just turn into like a, a tree knowledgeist of grand or anything. No, like yes, yeah, so flowers. Props, but that's that, but, but that is really important. Hang on, yeah. keeping good records. The reason we pay on time is because we keep good records. That's it. I mean, that's the tip. Keep good records. You need to write down everything. We have a folder for every. Uh, editor or every publisher we deal with, and in that we keep. I wish we brought the consignment forms and all that shit. You don't have that with you, do you? Maybe. I think I. Um. What we do is we have a we have a consignment form. It's a form we made on the computer. It has like, Tree of Knowledge has the put your address on everything. When you send an invoice to a distro with your zines or whatever, God put the address on there. That's really important like so many times we'll get something it'll just say like so many copies of some sort and it'll be no address you already sold out of the zines by the time you're trying to pay them you have no address there so you know it's just like really important to put your address on everything so anyway it's got the address address email phone um phone number web page the phone number is really good too just important it's yeah. crucial that's what I mean. we like to call people up and have the zines like that you know we don't want to write a letter and have them check it three months later or whatever and when we're restocking and stuff, I don't know. But 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 record keeping is, is really the most important thing in running 
a distro or a mail order, any business, anything where money's involved, really good records, good organized, and up to date. We keep all the orders we receive too, which is something a lot of people don't do, they throw it away. But now we've got two big boxes full of envelopes from pretty much the beginning. <coughs> and uh, we use that for our mailing list, and also there'll be times where people won't receive their order, they'll call. And it's good to have that to like be able to say, well, we don't have the envelope, so we never received it. So it was your fault that you put fifty dollars in cash in the envelope. It was clear or whatever. Do you want to talk about um, never send cash? That's 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 something else. It's probably not a good idea to send cash, though. People, we've gotten uh, envelopes with over a hundred dollars cash. We get people from times. like Sweden. It's yeah, like a like hundred dollar bill, an American hundred dollar bill. It's <coughs> a lot of. I mean. Uh, you can do that. That's your risk you're taking, but it's not the distributor's fault if they don't get it. Trust the postal. So a money order it costs a couple dollars, but it might be the best way to go. Yeah, that insurance is really worth it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, they're not just money. Yes. Yeah. Not all day. Not all day. It's just the I've gone to them. Like Western Union is like seventy-five. So anyway, it's that's a good thing to think about. Um, any other questions? Anybody got any questions? Day to day stuff? How we do it? What's the square root of seven? Anybody got any questions? <laughs> Radicals. <laughs> anybody have any funny stories? Anybody been screwed by anybody they want to out? Oh, no. Three of knowledge. You mentioned the thing about being screwed over and it made me think of uh, second nature because they. I've that's seen two different magazine. Yeah, I've seen two different issues where they've <coughs> they've written entire articles about, you know, stories of people screwing them over. So it's, <laughs> it's a real problem. That it's can a serious happen to problem. You, I mean, yeah. yeah, it's a real problem. It, it not only is it an economic loss, it really just it ruins your faith in what we're trying to do as as a scene or as a community, whatever you want to call it. I mean this all exists. Like the reason Mary and I whoever else, any zine editor, spends all their time doing this and not getting paid is because they care about it. And when people don't care enough to, to come through on their end of, of any kind of transaction, be it economic or otherwise, it just sucks. Not pretty profound. Are you going to talk about like a mailing list, building a mailing list, the importance of that? Yeah, um, actually, if anyone here has a distro and has a good program for a mailing list to put on their PC, we're looking for it. Um, What's wrong with the one again? Well, it could be better. <laughs> but um, Barry does the mailing list. I do the catalogs. What do you use right now? I just have a little spreadsheet. Microsoft Works. Well, what? I don't. It's on your computer. PowerPoint. Yeah. I, I just got. I just got a whole new set. We'll talk about that later. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. Um, <laughs> when we get the orders in, we have a box, and after we fill the orders, we put them in there, and whenever we get a chance, we'll go through and we enter the addresses into a database. Have it. Uh, there's different fields for the name and the address, the state, and the zip code, and that way we can either sort it by people's names. If there's a specific address we need to find, we can do it that way. Or uh, we have a bulk mail permit, so we have to order things by the zip code. So having the field separated, it's easy to sort them. <coughs> the computer will do it. We'll put them in like a sitting order. If you do a mail order, it's really good to have a mailing list. <coughs> we have our catalog updates about new things we've published, uh, not consistent things we've published, but um, we have a bulk permit which we don't know a lot about because we just got it and we haven't used it yet, um, but you pay, we paid $85 and I think it's actually more now, the postal rates went up, I think it's about $100, uh, you have it for a year and you save money that way. Um, if, if you mail out four times Everything more. has to weigh exactly the same, it has to be all uniform together. Sorted by zip code. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do that, Scott? Bulk mail, I, years ago I had a, had a bulk mail permit, 95, um, and I did three mailings and then I moved. But it was it was a really good thing. <laughs> did you save a lot of money? Well, I would have, I would have if I'd used it more, but I, I wound up paying Postcard at the time was twenty cents, so I was paying eight. I wound up paying eighteen cents on the postcards that I was sending out, and I would send out five thousand, five thousand at a time. 
Um, do I think it was worth it? In terms of the response that I got back from it, I think um, I think it was much better just sending out um, individual piles of ad, like Xerox ads. Yeah. That that's the way that like I really built. I really, I like, I really think that that's the way Bloodlink built itself. That's actually your knowledge built itself. Too. Yeah, I mean, I like, I like, I have, you know, I send out stuff that you have not knowledge all the time, and like, there's like certain people, like stick figure, um, like every every letter I I send out. Yeah. I was gonna say, you can also like um, going on like a call op with the bulk mail permit because even if it has like different addresses on it. Because um, like my friends who have record labels, like they basically all use the same permit for all their different stuff, and um, like that's illegal. Is it? I don't, I don't think it's illegal. Um, I mean, because they're still paying their their bills, and no one's gotten in trouble for it. <coughs> it is illegal. Labels. It is illegal. You're not, you have to have you have to have a standard address a standard address that has to appear at the same time. You have to have the, the barcode on it or the, the the line the line code and you have to have the the bulk bulk mail number on there. Um, like there are people who get around who get around you it. Kind of cheat on it. Like if someone but doesn't mind having your address on there, like they can totally use it. And uh, or like when we mail out our catalogs, we're sitting out an ad for the team conference in Bowling Green. Like you bring that aside. Yeah. So he's kind of getting the best benefit from it. Yeah, that's another thing. Anybody that can make it to this thing in Bowling Green is <coughs> really going to get fast. It's uh, a Zine conference, and it's turning out to be a pretty good-sized deal. So we should, we'll be there, and anybody else that can make it should do it. Um, if anybody wanted to talk, I could throw this out. If anybody wanted to get really cheap postcards made for anything, 1-800 uh, postcards, four-color printing on one side, red and, red and black on the other. Um, Two hundred dollars for five thousand full color. You just have to send them a zip disk, or it's two fifty or something for five thousand. Also, I, one thing I said earlier, I just want to clarify: as far as making your zine nice looking, doesn't mean you have to use a computer. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's amazing. There's techniques you can read about and learn for cut and paste layout that are amazing. Like um, all the spectacles I've done number four and a half, you know, number four, we're done, cut and paste. <coughs> People are always freaked out. I learned a lot of techniques from a, a zine I read, shit if I can even remember the name, but it, it was a zine, a cut and paste zine that told how to do cut and paste. And it was incredible. I wish, I don't even know if I still have it, but, but uh, stuff like that. I mean, the zine called In Abandon that we have on our table has some of the best layout I've ever seen. It's all cut and paste. So don't don't think you have to use a computer to like that's just no, don't. But for we use it for like this database stuff Mary's talking about. It's incredible how easy that is with the computer. <coughs> we in our catalogs on the computer. Anything else? Please sign that thing. And uh, another thing I wanted to mention was we have a lot of catalogs here and uh, anybody who wants one, please take one. Anybody who could give them to other people or put them in their orders scenes they do anything or drop a stack off at the local record store we need help getting them out because we still have a lot and uh, <coughs> anybody that can do that we really need stuff we have little ads too not with us but you can write us and get like six of a page if you do mail if you have lots of pen pals whatever you can put those out in your mail those really help us out <coughs> you can send us some for your project yeah we'll be happy to return the orders. favor and that's a good thing too if you have a zine or a distro and you want to advertise it. It's really good and cheap advertising. It's a really good networking tool to send it to people. Uh, even if you order a record from like Ebullition, like send them a stack of your ads and they tend to just throw them in. I think the, the most important thing about doing a zine to always keep in mind is that, is that it's, it's really all about your network of people. It's all about your connections that you're building. And and you know, even if you produce the nicest thing, you know, the most you know, glossy cover and whatever, you know, you really have to put in a lot of work, staying in touch with all of your distributors and other zine write and other zine writers, um, right? Either through writing letters or calling or whatever, you know. And you have to be really prepared to do that. Like otherwise, you know, you 
you're kind of setting yourself up for not being able to sell it because you know not being able to sell what you have because it's like who wants to talk more or ask any like kind of details or anything Scott. No, not yet. But it probably will be. I really like your closing note. Thank you. If anyone is uh, planning on participating into the uh, in the open mic, if you could come to me, and I'll buy it out right away. And like Scott and Amy know all that well, but I think now is like the best time to hang out with you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.